Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and I have a rather unusual topic to discuss today and I'll just start. Kent Keel has been researching criminal minds for decades. He's the author of The Psychopath Whisperer, The Science of Those Without a Conscience. He's currently a neuroscience scientist at the University of New Mexico and he's also with a nonprofit organization called Mind Research Network. MRN has been gathering brain scans from thousands of people in U.S. prisons in order to determine the differences in the brains of criminals versus the general population and also differences in the brains of criminals who've committed murders versus those who have committed other types of crimes, including violent crimes. The research has been conducted in what I think is a pretty meticulous way, excluding people charged with felony murder, which is when you kill somebody in the process of another crime. It's not, it's a byproduct of the crime. It wasn't intended. Um, and people whose convictions were uncertain, people with abnormal radiology reports, traumatic brain injury, and diagnosed psychiatric disorders were excluded. Factors like substance abuse, time in prison, age, and IQ were controlled for. About 6,500 scans have been collected from over 3,000 participants since 2007. MRIs show that there are significant differences in several regions of the brain and men who've committed murder as compared to those who have been convicted of other crimes, including other violent crimes. Those who committed impulsive homicide, which is attributed to a lack of emotional control and a tendency to have overblown reactions, have poor frontal lobe function and abnormal levels of serotonin metabolites in their cerebrospinal fluid. People who commit premeditated murder have other differences in their brain, such as reduced amygdala activation during emotional processing. The researchers in looking at this data and presenting it are not claiming that these abnormalities can be used as predictors of who will and who will not commit murder, but they do think that at some point in time defense lawyers may use these types of data in order to argue that a person charged with murder isn't liable for their actions due to circumstances outside of his or her control, such as brain structure and function. Now, I personally find this really scary because this would allow people who commit violent crimes, including murder, to avoid taking personal responsibility for their actions and instead to portray themselves as victims of defective brain structure. So I think what we need to do is ask ourselves, what causes these types of brain abnormalities? Drug and alcohol abuse can do it, but so can prescription drugs. For example, studies show that SSRIs, which are prescribed to treat depression, can cause permanent abnormalities to the frontal lobe and when given to children can lead to permanent brain dysfunction. Atypicals prescribed to antipsychotics also affect these areas of the brain, as do benzodiazepines. In fact, well-known side effects of antidepressants include an increased risk of suicide and violence. The Las Vegas shooter had metabolites of benzodiazepines in his blood at the time he committed one of the bloodiest rampages in the history of the United States. Columbine shooter Eric Harris was taking Lovix at the time of the school shooting. Um, a review of FDA adverse event reporting system data showed that a disproportionate number of violent events was associated with 31 drugs, including Chantix, the smoking drug, 11 antidepressant drugs, two ADHD drugs, and five sleep aids and tranquilizers. In other words, based on this type of information, we've known it for a long time, many of the violent acts, including mass murders in the United States, are not due to changes in the brain that were present at birth, but rather changes in brain structure resulting from medical treatment, specifically drugs often prescribed by psychiatrists and other medical doctors. Perpetrators are not victims of faulty brains, but victims of medical treatment that results in faulty brains. Now this opens up some really great areas of litigation that I hope somebody will pursue. Convicted murderers could sue drug makers and the doctors who prescribe the drug without fully, fully informing them for damages because their life is ruined. Families of convicted murderers could sue for damages related to loss of income from a family member who has been committed, incarcerated over committing a violent crime. Drug, co drug companies could be sued and forced to pay damages, but maybe even more important to strengthen the warnings on the labels of their products to make sure that people understand more the liability involved in taking these products. And doctors could be sued for carelessly prescribing these drugs, which is sometimes done after only a few minutes of conversation. Um, in fact, uh, many people who have joined Wellness Forum have told us that they spend five minutes with their psychiatrist to get a prescription and uh, it's you know, very easy to get Prozac or something of that nature from a family practice doc or an OB-GYN. 
I don't like lawsuits, but sometimes financial penalties are really the only way that you can get somebody's attention and motivate change. This strategy really worked for the tobacco companies and their bad behavior. They're still selling products that harm people, but they're, they have a lot more restrictions now than they did before all the lawsuits. And it may work for psych drugs if enough of these types of cases are successful in court. I know that one of our business partners, Dr. Peter Bragan, who you're probably familiar with, has spent his life trying to reform the psychiatric profession um, and go after these kinds of, of, um, of issues uh, in, in terms of the side effects of these drugs, the terrible things that happen as a result of taking them, and address the fact that most people don't know. Um, but um, lots of work to do to clean this up. And um, uh, again, we, I, I don't think that we can say that I know we can't say that everybody who takes these drugs is going to become violent or, or suicidal, but it is a known side effect and the risk and, and incidence is much higher in the medicated population. So interesting and disturbing information. That's all for today and for the week. Hit the subscribe button if you're not a subscriber. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it and I will be back to you next week with more news.